Hey guys, it's Sensuki, and welcome to my beginner's guide to Pillars of Eternity. This video will introduce you to the gameplay and mechanics of Pillars of Eternity. This is a guide for all types of people interested in playing the game, from people who might be new to PC RPGs, new to isometric party-based RPGs, or people who have never played the Infinity Engine games, or people who have played the Infinity Engine games or are really good at them, but don't necessarily know much about Pillars of Eternity. This guide will give a verbose and in-depth rundown of character creation and basic controls before going into an in-depth explanation of the mechanics in combat and give a brief introduction on how to use the individual classes in combat. This is part one of the guide and it will be an introduction and focus on character creation and then after I've done that I'll split the guide into two parts and the second part will focus on the uh, how to play the game and an introduction to the mechanics in combat. This guide may end up being quite long, so I'll split it into a few different parts, as I said before, and each individual section will um, be bookmarked in the video description, so if you would like to skip to any section, they'll all be clearly labelled there. I would recommend watching most or all of the video if you have never played Pillars of Eternity before, but the most important section is the melee engagement section, which will be included in part 2, as it is a system that may under end up being very unforgiving to people that do not understand how it works, so if anything, stick around for that. My video will be spoiler free if you've watched the E3 press demo from mid-2014. I will not be showcasing the end of the prologue, and after having experienced it myself firsthand while playing the game, I think it would be unfair to rob you of that experience by watching me play through it. I'd also recommend that if you plan on watching any other streams between now and the release date, to be mindful of such spoilers, as you'll never get to experience it as I did if you spoil it for yourself in a video. Pills of Eternity is a party-based real-time with pause RPG where you make your own character and either use the available companions, make your own adventurers, or go it solo. There are four difficulty settings in the game and two optional modes. Easy dif how difficulty works in Pills of Eternity is that instead of using level scaling, creatures are added or removed from individual encounters based on the, your selected difficulty level. Easy difficulty is recommended for people who don't necessarily enjoy combat or aren't really looking for any sort of challenge. Normal difficulty is recommended for people who enjoy a mild combat challenge and aren't familiar with Pillars of Eternity or people who have never played this style of game before. Hard difficulty is the best difficulty for people who enjoy challenging combat and is recommended for people who are good at the Infinity Engine games or people who enjoy combat in MMOs, RTS games and MOBAs. This is my favourite difficulty as it includes the intended encounter design for the game. Path of the Dam difficulty is a challenge difficulty that includes all creatures from every difficulty level and increases their stats, I think by 50% or something like that. Expert mode is an optional mode that um, you can toggle on for a playthrough. Once you've toggled it on you can't turn it off and it disables all of the UI and helper features in the game and also turns on permadeath and um, limits the availability of your stash. Trial of, trial of Iron Mode is like Iron Man Mode or Hardcore Mode and um, what happens there is uh, you have a rolling save and if your party is wiped your save game is deleted. I'm going to choose Hard Difficulty. This beautiful art was made by Kazunori Aruga and really captures the Icewind Dale concept art style. I'm going to skip the introduction because you'll be able to uh, listen to that yourself when you play the game. Okay, so this is the character creation screen. The game will be reactive to many of your choices at character creation, so if you're interested in role playing, you may want to be mindful of that. Your sex, race, class, culture, attributes, skills, and character background are all checked in many dialogues and scripted interactions. Your culture and background influence your character's autobiography, which is automatically generated from choices you make over the course of the game, and I will show that off later in the guide. Um, so, usually when I play um, RPGs, I like to play as females, so I'm going to pick that. There are six races in Pillars of Eternity and 15 sub-races. I'm sure that you all know humans, dwarves, and elves, um, but there are three new races specific to the world of Pillars of Eternity. 
or Mauer, which are semi-aquatic races, uh, a semi-aquatic race that are mechanically similar to half orcs. Orlins, who are kind of like halflings with fur and big ears, and the Godlike, which is basically a cross between Plain Touched and Ganassi from D and D. And uh, there are four different types of Godlike: Death, Fire, Moon, and Nature. I usually pick what. I usually pick races based on what class I'm going to play, but uh, for now I'll start off to sh with showcasing the Amawa, which is a new race. And um, I'm going to... The sub-races have um, different passive abilities. Every single sub-race in the game has a different passive ability, or a unique passive ability, except the human sub-races, which all share the same passive ability. Um, I'm going to go with Island Amawa, because it grants an additional weapon set, and um, that's really good for characters that focus on gun builds. Um, I'll be going over the classes in more detail uh, in the second part of my guide, but I'll give a quick rundown of all the classes now and give a few examples on how you can build them. The Barbarian class is a class that excels at dealing mellow AoE damage in combat. Every time they make a standard attack, they roll carnage hits against nearby enemies and have several active abilities that deal AoE damage as well as some optional AoE debuffs. They have lots of health, but they are easy to hit and I would not recommend using them in a tanking role. They are best played as a striker, which is equivalent to a carry or a DPS in MMO and MOBA terms. The Chanter is a unique class to Pills of Eternity and flavor-wise is like a barbarian or a, sorry, a bard or a scald, but is mechanically very different. Chanters put together phrases to form a chant in which they chant in combat. Chants act as a passive aura and their phrases have a short duration and a linger effect and with a high intellect it is possible to have three of them overlapping at once. Once a chanter has chanted three times in combat, they can cast an Invocation, which is a, a powerful AoE damage, disable, buff, or summon spell. The chanter is a very flexible class in combat and can be played any way you like. I personally prefer them as a tank because they aren't a very active class. The Cypher is another unique class to Pills of Eternity and is inspired by the Psionicist and Soul Knife classes from D&D. Cyphers have a focus resource that fills their powers in combat. They start with some focus at the beginning of each encounter and generate it by making weapon attacks with their soul whip passive ability. The best way to play them is to open with their powers and then switch to weapon attacks when your focus is low before returning to powers again. They are a great damage dealing and disable class and all of their powers require either a friendly or hostile unit as a target. Their damage spells are foe only, which means that they do not hurt nearby allies, unlike the AoE spells of most of the other classes. The Druid is a maybe a familiar class to those who've played fantasy RPGs or D&D before. Um, the Druid in Pills of Eternity combines the Druid's familiar ability to shapeshift with the mechanics of a sorcerer from 3rd edition D&D. Druids are a spellcasting class. They can cast first level spells at level 1, and then they gain a new spell every two levels. And um, when they unlock a, sorry, every two levels thereafter, when they unlock a spell level, they can cast any spell from that level, but only a certain number of spells from that level per day. And they get more spell casts per level as they progress, or every second level. Currently, Druids are the best damage dealing class in the game. Their spells have a huge damage and a huge AoE. And they have large AoE crowd control abilities, as well as a few healing spells later on. They are one of the best classes in the game at the moment. The Fighter is a class that everyone who's ever played an RPG is probably familiar with, and the implementation of that class slightly varies from game to game. Fighters in Pillars of Eternity are like a cross between the D&D 4th edition classes of Fighters and Wardens. They are a tank class by design, but also have reliable damage output and optional crowd control abilities. This flexibility allows you to build them in several different ways. Sword and board, two-hander and rage builds all work, and soon the single wield build might be viable too, but currently it's a bit iffy. My favourite build is a high intellect fighter that roves around the battlefield knocking enemies down, which I'll, do, I'll showcase later on. They are also the only class in the game that regenerates endurance by default. 
the Monk is one of the most fun classes to play in Pills of Eternity because they have lots of cool single target crowd control abilities. Similar to Cyphers and Chanters, monk ha Monks have a unique class resource called Wounds. For every 10 damage taken, the Monk gains a wound. The Monk then spends these wound points to power their abilities which costs all different amounts of wounds. There's a talent that allows you to reduce the wound threshold to 8. This means that a monk this means that as a monk you need to be getting hit to be the most effective. They can also they can be built quite a few different ways such as a tank or a striker class that focuses on single target disable a bit like an anti carry in um, in a MOBA. Their best ability is probably Force of Anguish which allows you to kick an opponent across the screen and knock them prone and it only costs two wounds so if you're getting hit a lot you can use it often and it's quite funny. The Paladin class in Pillars of Eternity is thematically a bit different to what most people are used to as there is no alignment and no black and white good or evil in Pillars of Eternity. Paladins in Pillars of Eternity must be fiercely devoted to a cause and currently the game makes you choose a Paladin order of which there are five options as you can see here. These Paladin orders have favoured dispositions which is a reputation and personality system that I'll talk about a bit later, but it basically means that you're expected to pick um, these di dispositions in dialogue. You don't necessarily have to uh, do that, but there are minor, minor penalties for it, which you can offset with a single talent. Mechanically, they are a bit of a cross between the, a martial or a warlord class in D&D, &D, uh, with a few paladin-like abilities. They are designed as a support class, but they have the highest defenses out of all the classes in the game, and optional passive motor lawers that benefit party members within a small AoE. So, one of the best ways to play them is as a tank. They can also work well as a ranged class, and currently a bleak walker paladin Arkabuzia is uh, one of the hardest hitting builds in the game. The Priest is another arch-typical class that I'm sure everyone will be familiar with. Priests in Pillars of Eternity are similar to clerics from 2nd edition AD&D and require a patron deity of which they, there are currently five choices. They have the same spellcasting mechanics as Druids where they unlock spells every odd level and have access to all of the spells of that level and can gain more casts every even level. Priests are a support class that have a lot of very nice buffs, debuffs, and single target damage abilities. Personally, I don't like the healing spells that much. Currently, they are very weak and most of the time aren't worth the cost of the spell slot. That may be subject to change. Priest spells are kind of close range, so while you don't really want them to be in melee range, you kind of need them to be close to your allies, so positioning is important. The Priest of Skane is very similar to a multi-class cleric rogue as they have a passive backstab like ability which works well with Jill's stilettos. Priests and paladins are expected to follow their diet sorry priests like paladins are also expected to follow their deities favored dispositions but like I said you're not required to and you can offset the minor penalty uh, from doing that with a talent. The ranger in Pillars of Eternity plays a lot differently to from a ranger in D&D. Rangers have an animal companion, and you can use choose between a few different animals, which um, is after this menu here. So there's uh, antelope, bear, boar, lion, stag, and wolf. Um, the animal companion and the ranger are bonded, so if one of them falls in battle, the other suffers severe penalties. The ranger is the only class in the game that hasn't really worked out as planned, so instead of being the best ranged class, they actually play better as a melee class that focuses on area control and teaming up on enemies with their animal companion for additional accuracy and damage bonuses. This playstyle requires a bit of micromanagement and is not for everyone. They are still pretty good at using ranged weapons, but not as good as rogues. The Rogue is one of my favourite classes in Pills of Eternity because they are the single best single target damage dealer in the game. They play similarly to Rogues in 4th edition and MMOs. The main class feature of the Rogue is their sneak attack passive ability which they qualify for in the first 2 seconds of combat and when they are attacking an enemy that is affected with one of 9 different status effects such as prone, flanked or stunned. They have many abilities that can inflict these status effects, as do many other classes in the game. They are also the class that gets the most mileage out of stacking damage bonuses or damage multiplier stacking, which I'll talk about later on. They have a lot of single target special attacks, passive abilities, and optional teleport and invisibility. 
There are a lot of different ways to build rogues, and one of my personal favourite ways of playing them is sneaking up close to enemies and blowing their head off with a blinding strike blunderbuss sneak attack at the start of combat. The Wizard is another class that will be familiar to pretty much everyone for the most part as they play like you would expect. Wizards are a spellcasting class that focuses primarily on AoE damage, AoE disable and self buffing. Currently I don't think the self buff spells are worth the investment but that may change in the future. Wizard spell ca Wizards cast spells from a magical tome called a grimoire which you can't currently see in character creation because of a bug. They um, the Grimoire can hold four spells of each level, and they can cast spells directly from the Grimoire, but also memorize and learn spells so that they can transfer them between Grimoires. Wizards can cast first level spells at level 1, and gain access to a new spell level at every odd level, and additional spells every second level. Additional spell slots every second level. They have a nice per encounter AoE ability called Ar Arcane Assault, which they start with at level 1, and an optional talent that allows them to deal... Which, which is an optional talent that allows them to deal foe-only AoE damage. Um, sorry, no. Um, they also have an optional talent called Blast, which allows them to deal foe-only AoE damage from implement attacks. And for the record, implements are rods, wands, and scepters, which are ranged weapons in the game. And you can see them um, holding one here. They are, also, they are a very useful class, although fans of mages in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons might be a bit disappointed I think their best spell at the moment is actually a first level spell called Slicken, which is an invaluable AoE disable that causes units caught in the AoE to slip over twice in a row. Um, I'm, next I'm going to go on to attributes, I'll just quickly pick um, a class and an ability. So um, this is the ability screen and at, um, when you pick a class you'll be given the choice of one ability. Uh, and I think for most classes it's an active ability. So this is the Barbarian, and you have the choice between Frenzy and Barbaric Yell. Um, so I'm just going to pick Frenzy for the, the demonstration of this, but um, Frenzy is an active ability, and you can, it acts pretty much like Barbarian Rage in any other game. It is a, um, an ability that has no recovery time, so you just cast it and you're ready to go, and you you have bonus might, constitution, attack speed, um, but you're, re you're a bit easy to hit and you can't see your um, health and endurance multipliers or values, they're obscured in the UI. This is the attribute selection screen. Attributes in Pillars of Eternity are checked often in dialogue and scripted inter interactions. Might, dexterity and constitution are checked more often in scripted interactions and perception, intellect and resolve are checked more often in, more often in dialogue. They are also used to determine what kind of things characters are good at, good at in combat. The way they apply to combat is completely different from Dungeons and & Dragons, and all attributes have a universal effect on every class in the same way. I won't claim that the attributes in Pillars of Eternity are realistic, but they're somewhat mechanically interesting. I would also like to note that, since this is not D&D, what attributes grant in combat is subject to change in future patches. All attributes have a baseline of 10, and all... Attribute scores will incur a mal all attribute scores under ten will incur a malice to um, the drive stats, as you can see in the um, in the information screen over here. And all of attributes above ten will incur a bonus to the drive stats, which you can see in the um, in the screen over here. Um, and the a character's secondary defenses, which is fortitude, reflex, and will, are primarily comprised of bonuses granted by your attributes. Might is checked in dialogue and scripted interactions for physical intimidation and brute force. Might also grants a percentile increase to damage and healing and, in, and an integer bonus to the fortitude defense. There is a special formula for damage calculation in this game that I will get onto later in the, that I will get, I'll get onto later in, on in the guide because it's pretty important. But one important thing to note is that might help offsets the damage penalty from scoring a graze. If you're planning on building a DPS character, might should be your first attribute choice unless you are a caster as inter intellect may be more relevant. It is important to note that it uh, it only provides a bonus healing from which you are the source. And what I mean by that is, when you're casting a healing spell on someone else, your might will make that spell more powerful, not theirs. I also believe it affects healing potions as well. Um, constitution is checked in dialogue and scripted interactions to withstand pain or to endure physically taxing feats such as swimming underwater. In combat, Constitution grant... Um, grants you a percentile bonus to endurance and health and an integer bonus to fortitude. 
And this would be a good time to explain the health mechanics or the health system in Pillars of Eternity, which is very similar to um, Dungeons and Dragons 4th Edition's health system. Health is a strategical resource with, uh, and um, is your total daily health. It can only be replenished through resting or through a couple of optional talents that can restore a small portion of it. Endurance is your immediate health resource. When you have no endurance left, you are knocked out in combat and until combat ends or someone revives you with a special ability. If you run out of health, one of the two things will happen depending on whether you have the permadeath option enabled in the game options. If you do have permadeath enabled, you will die. If you don't, then you will be maimed and return to one health after combat ends. If you are maimed, you will suffer huge penalties until you rest and if you take one or more points of damage, you will die. When you take damage, it is dealt both to health and endurance. So when you take 6 damage, you take 6 um, health damage and 6 endurance damage. It is important to note that constitution, the constitution bonus to health and endurance scales with level and on a class to class basis as different classes have different starting endurance scores as you can see, as you would have seen in the class menu over here. See um, 48 plus 16 per level, 42 plus 14 per level. Um, you you get more mileage out of it on, on classes with larger health multipliers. Personally, I find this system a bit wonky, and in my experience playing the beta, I haven't really found Constitution that great of an attribute, as it provides you less survivability in combat than raising your defenses, which is deflection, fortitude, reflex, and will, um, if you have already have high defenses. So if you've already got a really high deflection, it's better off to raise deflection instead of putting points into constitution because it mean you get you'll get hit let, you'll survive longer in combat than um, putting points into constitution. It's uh, it's better than um, so like barbarians and monks, it's good it sounds like a good idea to put constitution on them, but for fighters, paladins, chanters and rangers, um, they benefit more from perception and resolve if you want to survive longer. Dexterity is checked in dialogue and scripted interactions for sleight of hand and fast reactions. In combat, dexterity gives you a percentile bonus to action speed and an integer bonus to reflex. This is a special bonus that increases the speed of both the animations of your actions and reduces the recovery time of the, those animations, which I will demonstrate in part 2 of the video. Animation speed is calculated in frames per second and in most games, um, this speed of, is independent of the game's frame rate. The animation speed in Pills of Eternity is 30 frames per second, which means that a 30 frame animation is one second long. Recovery time by default is the same length of the animation multiplied by 1.2. So a 30 frame animation would have a 36 frame recovery time. 20 dexterity, um, which is probably not attainable on this race, gives you a 30% bonus to action speed. So it would reduce a 30 frame animation down to 21 frames, which is 30% of 30, which equals 9. So 30 minus 9 equals 21. And it would reduce a 26 frame recovery down to... Um, down to... Sorry, a 36 frame recovery by 10 frames down to 26 because 30% of 36 is 10.8, although there is, there is no such thing as a partial frame. So you only count the last full frame. That's how you calculate um, action speed in this, in um, or like attack speed in games, because in real time games they calculate things in frames, not seconds or milliseconds or whatever. Action speed has more of an impact on um, fast actions as they benefit the most from their speed increase. Far, um, as they benefit from the speed increase far more often, so it's better used on characters that are using light weapons or spells with quick cast times. Personally, I think Dexterity is a pretty good either as a secondary or tertiary attribute for DPS characters, but not so great for the classes that have per rest limits on their spells. I wouldn't use it as a primary attribute for anyone. Perception is used in dialogue and scripted interactions to discern lies, make observant comments, and notice things happening in the background. In combat, Perception grants an integer bonus to Interrupt, Deflection, and Reflex. The interrupt system is complicated. Is a complicated system for determining whether a character is interrupted in combat. Interrupts are kind of like mini stuns and cancel currently playing animations, channeling, and increase recovery time by the amount designated by the attack being made. I will explain the interrupt system later on in the guide as it is a very complicated system. 
The benefit of interrupting enemies has to your party is that it theoretically reduces their DPS and total durations of afflictions inflicted on your party. And it is best paired with either attacks that have a long interrupt or paired with fast attacks. I currently find the difference pretty negligible and I don't find interrupt focus builds very good at the moment. I would say that perception is more of a tanking attribute as it is one of the attributes that increases your primary defense deflection as you can see over here. Um, I think it works best on tank characters only. Perception has undergone a few changes over the course of development and is currently a bit underpowered for combat in my opinion. It is used to provide an accuracy bonus instead of a deflection bonus and I hope they change it back in the future. Intellect is used in dialogue and scripted interactions for deduction, realization and problem solving. Intellect grants a percentile bonus to AoE bonus in total size in in-game meters and all active abilities and spells have a visual area of effect that shows the intellect bonus um, from the base as a larger green circle. The intellect bonus to AoE is also considered foe only, and that means that if you cast a fireball and one of your characters is in st standing inside the bonus area of effect, they will not take damage. Intellect is the best attribute in the game for all caster classes, as all caster classes have area of effect and duration based spells, and the AoE increase can allow you to deal more total damage to more targets than a smaller AoE but higher might may allow. Intellect is also very good on martial classes that if you're planning to use many active abilities. I really like it on the Barbarian, Rogue and Fighter in particular. Resolve is used in dialogue and scripted interactions for mental intimidation, leadership and all manner of convincing performances, which I'm sure you can guess what those are. In combat, it grants an integer bonus to concentration, deflection and the will defense. Concentration is part of the interrupt system and is used for resisting interrupts. As I said earlier, I will explain how that system works later in the guide. Concentration is useful if you're getting hit often as it means you don't get interrupted as much and thus don't lose action as many actions in combat. It is not very useful on the backline characters because you likely won't be getting attacked as often and since it is a purely defensive attribute, none of its drive stats will have any benefit or come into play if you're not being attacked. Much like Perception, Resolve is a good attribute for tank classes and frontline characters. When I make tank characters, I give them both a high Perception and Resolve for, because the Deflection and, and Defense bonuses rather than... Um, and I take them for the Deflection and Defense bonuses rather than for the Interrupt and Concentration values. Next up we have Culture, um, which is the final thing in character creation that uh, the game reacts to. As I stated earlier, NPCs in the game will react to your culture and it will influence how your autobiography begins. Um, mechanically picking a culture will give you a bonus attribute point which you can see over here in the description box. And that attribute point is actually already included in the attributes before you pick your culture which is a bug. It may or may not be fixed before release so be mindful of that when changing your culture. As you can see when I click Old Valia, it increases my intellect by one and reduces my resolve by one instead of just adding plus one. Um, as you can see, it also affects your starting gear. Um, I usually pick it for the attribute bonus. So, um, as you can see, like different cultures have um, different different styles of starting gear. So, diff you get different armors and different sets of weapons. Okay, the next is the character background. Each culture has a set of available character backgrounds, and this is another thing that in, uh, is reacted, reactive to the game. So it was my mistake saying the culture was the last thing. The background is actually the last thing in character creation that the game reacts to, and it is um, NPCs will often reference your background in dialogue. This mainly has a role-playing effect on the game, but it also gives you a bonus to skills, as you can see over there. Currently, the... Um, the skill bonus is pretty simulationist, so there's like 20 different ways to get plus 2 lore, but there's not many ways to get some of the other stats. Um, and I'll go, I'll go into skills in part 2 of the video, um, and explain what, what they're used for. Um, so I'll pick a, pick a culture. Now, this is the appearance screen. You're, you're given two primary colors, which um, changes like a minor part of most armor sets so that one changes the pants as you can see there um, you get a bunch of different skin colors um, for the Amawa currently their skin tone doesn't change it's just the the painted bit um, and some of those don't look fantastic at the moment as you can see um, there's a lot, you also get different heads I think I prefer this one 
and there are lots of different hair models and um, I think the character artists for this game have done an excellent job making these character models um, because they're made of many different parts put together which is really hard to design compared to just making a single um, non-changing uh, character model in, in a game such as like The Witcher or Dragon Age or something like that. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, the, char the character artists have done a, a really good job making this look good for this style of game. Next up is the portraits, which are mostly provided by internal artists at Obsidian. Um, there are a few portraits provided by uh, other artists, but the main two I know of are Kazanori Aruga and Lindsay Laney. The other artists I know who contributed um, some portraits is uh, Bobby Hernandez, who did uh, helmeted portraits, which I'll, show, I'll try and showcase off. I think he did that one and a few other ones. Um, so I'm going to choose that. This is the voice section. Um, now, currently, uh, you can select, as like in the Infinity Engine games, you can pick male or female voices um, for male, male or female characters. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, m the voices now, aren't really that I different. The they, they're I shall mo mostly just provide a flavor difference. The, um, the difference between the voice sets isn't as big as uh, the Icewind Dale games. And um, one of the really cool things I like about um, the name box is it takes special characters. So you can do stuff like this. So that's going to be my name for this um, for this guide. Okay, so I'm going to end part one here. Um, that's it for part one of the guide. I hope you liked it, and congratulations if you managed to watch the whole thing. The next part of the guide will focus on the basics of playing the game, the options menu, combat, and mechanics. And I think the third part of the guide will showcase just a general... Um, I'll like load a save game of each different class and show the same encounter and just give a, a general idea of how to play the different classes. Thanks for watching and the links to part 2 and 3 will be in the description of the video when I finish it.